I've never shown in any of my talks a photo of Alfred Wertheimer, but Alfred passed away a little over a year ago. I had a wonderful 20-year relationship with Alfred. In fact, it was the most satisfying uh, professional relationship I've had in my 40-year career. And uh, he enabled me to do so much with his work. And I was the right person at the right moment for Alfred. And, uh, uh, but this is Alfred. When he photographed Elvis, he was 26 years old. And uh, Elvis was 21. He had just come out of the Army and was a freelance photographer and got a phone call from Ann Fulcino at RCA, who had just bought Elvis's contract from Sam Phillips, the legendary founder of Memphis Recording Service, known more popularly as Sun Records. And uh, uh, Anne called Al, who had done freelance assignments to take press photos of Perry Como and Tony Bennett and uh, Lena Horne and, and, and Nina Simone and Toscanini, the conductor, and so many people. And so he was called one day to photograph their new star, their new person they signed named Elvis Presley. And, and Alfred said, Elvis who? And that's just an indication of how, how, un, how Elvis really was pretty much not nationally known at the time. Of course, he released some great records with uh, Sam Phillips, some, you know, Mystery Train. And frankly, my favorite music of Elvis is really, RCA was great early RCA, but those Sun Records, you can't replace them. You know, it makes me think, this is, by the way, a photograph he shot him March 17th, 1956, St. Patrick's Day. It's just a coincidence. It happened to be the, the first day he photographed Elvis Presley. And uh, uh, this was a rehearsal for the Dorsey Brothers stage show. Many of you may know of the Dorsey Brothers. They were a big band, and they had a... Uh, a weekly TV show, just like Ed Sullivan had, and, and it was but a little bit predated that, and very popular show. And so Elvis came up to New York to do uh, among his first national broadcasts, and this is a rehearsal for that. And one thing I always like to point out is his guitar uh, strap is a chord. This is how early it was. If you want some proof, there's the knot in the chord. So he really is, you know, this country, you know, young boy from the South, and here he is, his first trip in New York, and this, this Martin Kirk guitar, which is like a holy grail, actually, but there it is. He's, he doesn't even have a, have a proper chord. He, he soon did have one, but that's how authentic and raw and, and original this material was, and of course, the great Scotty Moore behind him, who is so influential. But the story begins, funnily enough, in New York City, and here he is alone walking down the street in New York. He was staying at the Warwick Hotel. I love this photograph of Alfred. You catch the Raleigh room up there, I think it is, and, and the, the neon is great, and the, the dark tones, and you get a sense of New York City there. And I love this gentleman in the corner. I knew this photo for a while before I even acknowledged the gentleman in the corner. And uh, he, he looks like he's certainly looking at Elvis, but uh, whether, he, whether he knew who he was or not. But I love that this begins with Elvis all alone in New York City and uh, walking into his hotel. Uh, it was Courtney, I think, who said that Elvis permitted closeness, and this is what Alfred Wertheimer has told us, and it's true. He told me he was so successful with Elvis because he permitted closeness. And sure enough, here's Elvis going into his own room, and there's Al trailing him. Elvis is on the couch here reading fan mail. Now, when we say he wasn't known widely, he, you know, he had a following largely in the South, but in other pockets all across the country. But it was strictly the Sun Records because he hadn't recorded for RCA yet. And Sun's distribution wasn't what RCA's was, but uh, Sun, Sam Phillips was very successful selling Elvis's records and recording them. But uh, anyway, uh, here he is reading some fan mail that the, they got up to him, and uh, it's a great shot. I love his Argyle socks. And uh, he, uh, uh, you know, his slacks, he, he had such a sense of style. Here he, he, he tore up the fan mail after reading, after reading it. And he Alfred said, why did you, why do you tear up your mail? And he said, uh, well, it's for me, and I've read it, so I got the message, and you know, it's just for me. And so it was a funny thing Elvis did with his fan mail. Of course, later he got so much fan mail, they had a building Graceland, a small building, just to handle the fan mail. And uh, so here he is, uh, uh, the stage show. And I love this because this is one of the classic poses of, uh, it's not even a pose. You know, everything Del Elvis did, he did instinct 
instinctively. Uh, of course, he knew the history of American music. Uh, he did, in fact, synthesize uh, blues, country, gospel, uh, and, and uh, what some called hillbilly, and, uh, and, and that's what created rock and roll, really. And then he brought his personal flavor out, right? And, uh, but the way he has his hand out, that gesture, and, and his, his, his knee bent and his foot up, it's just such a classic Presley gesture that, that everybody got to know. Of course, there's the chord again, and <laughs> to see his great drummer with his hands in the air. But I, I love this, this live shot of Elvis, uh, and uh, very exciting. This one, look at him, he's, he's off the floor. He's completely off the floor. And that, that's a real, represents the exuberance of Elvis. Why people loved him, why they flocked to him, why everybody was so excited about this young man. It, 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 he had it then, he had the passion, he had the energy, and it was something new and exciting. It was unfolding in front of his very eyes. He didn't realize it. When he got in Sam Phillips' studio and they were fooling around uh, that recordings weren't producing anything interesting and they took a break and he got up there and all of a sudden started strumming as a rock song, a very popular song by Bill Monroe, who uh, had been somebody who Elvis admired very much, uh, Blue Moon of Kentucky. It was a big hit for Bill Monroe back in the late 40s, early 50s. And here Elvis all of a sudden jazzes it up, rocks it up. And that's when Sam Phillips said, wait, 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 what's that? Do that again. And, uh, but this reminds me of, and he had Scotty and Bill Black and DJ Fontana and Sam Phillips who got them. And it was a unique, again, a, a great coming together of influences where these three guys were the perfect backup for this guy. And, uh, you know, I love it. So that's, that's the end of March 17th. So Elvis goes, goes, does a few shows down south, but he comes back to New York in June for two reasons. To perform on the Steve Allen show, and is also to do his first, and, and some more doors, and another stage show, but to do his first recording at RCA. And after all, they're a recording company, and they wanted to get their new guy up there. But I've explained that this is also the photo that first drew me to these photographs. It was on the cover of my favorite music biography I've ever read. It's called Last Train to Memphis. And it's written by America's greatest music biographer, a gentleman named Peter Ground, that just completed an extraordinary six years writing Sam Phillips' biography. As a matter of fact, just came out. Sam Phillips, the man who invented rock and roll. Sam, as m many of you know, but if you don't, also discovered Johnny Cash, old disc Carl Perkins, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Howlin' Wolf, as well as Elvis Presley and many others. And uh, but Last Train in Memphis is a, is a, is a, is a, is a magnificent biography of Elvis Presley. And this was on the cover of the book. And when I saw it in Barnes and Nobles, I picked it up, I said, that's it? That's the Elvis I knew as a kid growing up that, that, that imprinted on me, that, that wired my brain to rock and roll and had such a big influence on me as a young, young boy. And uh, here he is playing gospel piano. He loved gospel music. It was his favorite music, in fact. And he was sitting there alone playing gospel, waiting for uh, Steve Allen to come and the Colonel. And uh, there's Alfred, the fly in the wall. Alfred, as I said, his style of photography he calls fly in the wall. There's not a single photo posed in over 3,000 negatives, 3,000 shots to out, out took of Elvis. His, his view was to capture him as he was, and as you can see, he certainly did that. And as Courtney said, Al shared with us that Elvis permitted closeness. And, uh, you know, there was no contract. He shot him for press photos, was so enamored of this young fellow, I asked him, I, 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 he just said to him, Elvis, can I tag along? And Elvis just shrugged and said, yeah, that was the contract. Today you'd have agents and <laughs> publishers and, you know, and, and, and so he just literally followed him and at, from that point on and stuck with him. And uh, it's a great story. And, and, and also I said, Al, if he wasn't famous, why did you you know, what, what compelled you to follow me? He said, Chris, he made the girls cry. And that women, when they were around them, seriously, they would cry, they would sob, they would touch Elvis, they would, he said it was like a religious experience, really, because they were just, there was, this, and it was special, it was magic. It, it, Elvis just had something special. And, but of course, it's his music that communicated that, and they would have seen and heard a bit, a little bit of that. And, and uh, so here we are at a rehearsal for the Steve Allen show. <laughs> look, at, 
look at Elvis. <laughs> look at Elvis. I don't know what he's thinking about all this. But he had just appeared on a very, a very controversial appearance on Milton Berle's show. It controver controversial for some. Milton Berle, great, lively character. And Elvis, Milton encouraged Elvi Elvis's rhythmic movement. Elvis was, he, he he, he, he captivated you on stage because of the way he moved, the way he sort of vibrated his, his music, the way he danced, the whole thing. And it was unique. We have to remember, today we have people doing everything. I mean, they're lighting fires on stage, whatever. But you've got to remember, this was one young kid who never, nobody knew. And he'd get out there and dance in a way that it was, it, was, it was almost scandalous. In fact, it was scandalous to some people. But it was just this great young guy who had just discovered this form of music that we now call rock and roll. Quick, come on. He owed everything. Like I say, he loved Little Richard. He loved, he loved every R&B and blues and everything that went before him. But he brought it together so that kids like me from New York City, uh, who, you know, all of a sudden could, could love this music. But Milton Berle encouraged him to gyrate. It seemed, it, it was really exciting to see that footage. And you can see it any time on YouTube. But Steve Allen was more of a family show. And he had Elvis, this is a rehearsal, dressed in tails and white tie. And so Elvis couldn't move a lot. And he had him singing to this hound dog who wore the top hat. I'm, conv <laughs> I'm convinced this poor dog was tranquilized. Because all he had to be, all he did is look at him. He, all he did is sit there, never cause any problems. And, uh, and so this was that rehearsal. And and uh, there you go. So they had the rehearsal. The show was going to be in a day, uh, a day and a half later. But the colonel had booked Elvis to do two shows in Richmond, Virginia. And this is Elvis Presley having taken the train from New York to Richmond, walking off the train to get a taxi to go to the Jefferson Hotel, where even though they weren't spending the night, they needed a room because they were doing two shows, an afternoon show and an evening show at the Mosque Theater. It's still there. It's this fabulous Art Deco uh, building. And Elvis was given a transistor radio. And that's the script for the Steve Allen show under his arm. And uh, Alfred told me he had that he had it going like a boom box. It looks like a very serene scene, but evidently he had that thing cranked up to whatever music he was listening to. And I like to call this Elvis the pelvis because he said he really did have this distinct strut. And he felt that this photo captured a little bit. I see, we can see what he means, right? And uh, there he goes. Alfred calls this photo the stare. And, <laughs> Actually, he's not staring at, at Alfred. He's looking a little bit to Alfred's, Alfred's left. Our, yeah, and, uh, but I, that, sh that jacket is killer. I, I, seriously, I, that, it must be raw silk or something. But, and that shirt, you know, the way this kid dressed was unique. You know, it, it, nobody, he went to Hume's High School in Memphis wearing pretty much the same version of these clothes, not always a jacket, but often. And it was just uncanny. And I've mentioned before, I love the stylings in the car, <clears throat> the ribbing, the ribbing in the roof, the great chrome handle. <coughs> Wertheimer's photos have these great formal elements in them that when he composed the picture, somehow, you know, with his professionalism and his, his, his artistic sense, he could create these images in a way that were quite beautiful. And this is another example. Al used natural light. He never used a flash. He said in the 3,000 shots, he might have used a flash like eight or nine times. That's nothing. And here he is in the Jefferson Hotel uh, restaurant. And he's asking this waitress, you know, what's, what's for uh, dinner or lunch? And they'd read the menu. And Alfred told me at the end of it, they, wherever they went, they'd read a menu. And then they'd always order the same thing. <laughs> They just like to eat. They, and that's Junior Smith, Elvis's first cousin. Uh, Elvis's mom is Gladys Smith. And uh, uh, he was his entourage. Here you go, two, two young southern boys, two cousins. And uh, uh, it's a gorgeous painting. I've often said that the woman's profile looks like a, a Botticelli, like a Renaissance angel. And, uh, it's a, and again, look at that available light. Look at the waitress in the background, a little bit out of focus. There's just an incredible quality to this photo and the, the, dark, the dark elements. It's beautiful. This is the Jefferson Hotel lunch counter, coffee shop. And I met this gal, Barbara Gray, there. And Barbara uh, I became a, a, a subject of renown because she's in a famous photo that you'll see in a few minutes. But, uh, 
He's showing Barbara the script to the Steve Allen show. He didn't know Barbara, they just met. And uh, he was showing her the script to convince her that he was somebody she should pay attention to. And, uh, you know, he was working it, as they say. And uh, Barbara, Barbara seems absorbed in it. And Alfred called this photo grilled cheese 20 cents. And that's, that's you can see the reason why. And, and it, you know, I've always said Alfred's photos like Peter Groundlick's book, as a matter of fact, they're not just about Elvis, they're about America. They're about the way we were in the mid-50s, in 1956, uh, the way things looked. And, and I mean, that's, that's an, almost an archeological photo. <laughs> you, you don't get lunch counters like that every day anymore, and those great chairs, and I love the highlights of the chrome, you know, and the leather seats, and, uh, and who would know that's Elvis? I always love that photo because I bought it, and I'd have it hanging in my phone, on my home, in my home, and not everybody would understand that photo right away. And I love how you can see that Al was the observer, how you have this, this entry, this door, these, these, these uh, vertical forms that I think add a sort of power to the image. And uh, I love this photo. So here we are at the Moss Theater. He, the reason Elvis is going like that is the crowd is screaming, we want Elvis, we want Elvis. And uh, they were very excited to see him there in, in Richmond. And uh, he's with the Jordanaires. They were a quartet group, you know, the great Southern tradition of quartet gospel singing. And he loved that. And uh, he brought the Jordanaires into his music. And it was another great synthesis, bringing quartet musicians, uh, quartet singers into his rock and roll. That was, uh, you know, a, a great thing he did. And let's not forget, Rock and roll came from the South. What we call contemporary American music, whether it be blues, uh, country gospel, you know, for the most part, it came from, from, from these environs and from Alabama and from Mississippi and the great state of Mississippi. I think my friend Claire Hines is here, works for me in Washington. Here she is, and she's from Jackson, Mississippi. Great to see you, Claire and Ian. Thank you for coming. And so, uh, in fact, Claire spent the entire last summer Lisa and Courtney, taking apart every picture up there, cleaning them, dusting them, inspecting them, and putting them back together. So that's, that was Claire's summer last summer. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, Elvis is, is in the green room, as, a call, as, a, as we might call it. And what happens? Alfred, who's been with him every moment, all of a sudden, he disappears. He doesn't know where Elvis is. And he says, where, the, where did he go? He just sort of, Alfred turned his back, and somehow Elvis was gone. And Alfred, the intrepid photographer, went looking for him and found him behind the stage, so to speak, on a, on a, on a sort of a fire escape type of place. It was really just a back rugged stairwell. And Al comes around the corner, and there he is. And he says to himself, oh my god, he had an existential moment. Do I, do I photograph this, or do I leave? Is this such a pr personal scene that I don't do it? But he said, no. And this is why Al was great. Uh, he said, no, I'm here to document this guy, and I'm going to do it. And again, like I say, it was on his own. It was, he was just doing it, not for a job. There was no money to be made. It was on his own dime that he's with Elvis. And he decides yes. And he, he, there's a whole sequence of these photos that you can see in the Tashin book. But he decides to walk by, and he goes by and says, coming through like a maintenance man. And he goes behind them, and they don't even flinch. Because you see, he had to get to the other side because you want to, don't want to shoot into the light. Although in this case, it was a happy accident. It makes for a very engaging and, and mysterious kind of image. But he, as, a, as a good photographer, he wanted to get to the other side. Here he is halfway there. And it's funny to know that Alfred said, although Barbara sort of contradicted it to me in person once, I got to know Barbara, but he more, it more or less was the conversation, something like she said, you can't, I bet you can't kiss me. And Elvis said, I bet you can. And he went to kiss her, and he missed. She sort of turned away, just sort of toying with him. And, and Elvis's nose sort of banged into her cheek. And those photos are there, and, and they're quite charming and funny. But he, he pulls back then, and 
here's this f very famous photo, actually. It's, it's, it's been auctioned for tens of thousands of dollars. And I have to tell you something. There were a lot of people who came to meet Al Wertheimer in New York City saying they were Barbara Hearn. Seriously. <laughs> I'm not kidding, because he hadn't seen, we hadn't seen Barbara for over 50 years. She never surfaced again. And, but people came claiming they were Barbara Hearn for one reason or another. But Alfred knew that Elvis is down two steps. Barbara was only five feet three, something like that. And, and so, and in the earlier picture, you see her on a tiptoe. So Alfred said there were women coming in five feet 10. You know, oh, I'm Barbara Hearn. <laughs> Because of the Smithsonian tour I did, the show at the Grammy Museum, USA Today put this photo on the front page of USA Today. And Barbara Hearn saw that. Her boyfriend actually saw it. Barbara's in her 80s. And her boyfriend said, <laughs> said, look, you're on the cover of USA. And she said, that's it. I want the world to know that's me. Barbara, are you here tonight? We invited her. No, I was hoping she could. She lives in Charleston. So I just, before she got up and corrected me, I wanted to see if she's here. And, uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a great photo. And by the way, that was it. Then Elvis had to go out on stage. You know, it was two shows, an afternoon and an evening show. And this kind of contact for him, he gets out there and he, the audience went. He put, them, it's, he put them in a frenzy. And I'm not kidding. He put on such an incredible show. I like to think Barbara's inspiration. I, in fact, I know it. It was a big part of it. And he got out there. And this, to me, is one of the great all-time photos of rock and roll uh, because it really, when I said in the beginning, Elvis created what we, the rock persona as we know it, here's the evidence. And uh, to be on that one knee and again his foot up and the microphone and the formal elements that Alfred would always capture, it wasn't an accident, and, and, and that microphone with the light on it and the side lighting of Elvis's face and the, the footlights, you know, uh, it's just an extraordinary photo and you can only imagine the screaming going on right there and the music and Elvis is singing and the, his dancing, it, it, it really created a frenzy. So he did the two shows, gets back on the train with Junior Smith, his cousin, heads back to New York that night after the second show so he can be there in time to perform on the Steve Allen show. And uh, uh, this, this young woman came in from Long Island to meet Elvis, and her father brought her in. And you can see she is dressed in her Sunday finest, her little heart earrings and the hat and, and, and the dress. And she's got a little piece of paper in her hand. I don't know if he, she's getting an autograph or she's giving him his phone number. I, I have a feeling she's getting an autograph. And, and so Elvis has just pulled up and arrived. I'm sure there were some other people there. And I, I love that shirt he has on again. He, he had these great fashions. And look at the sweet smile on his face. And, uh, and she's just, you know, this is it. And, and so he says, great to meet you. And I've, I've got to go in now for the, for the show. And <laughs> she's just, you know, I, she's just, what can I say? You know, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And, uh, you know, I'm just noticing up there, are those people looking out the window? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I've never seen that before. And uh, it, it looks like it. And look at that dress. It, as I said, it, it, you can see the fashions of those days, even the way, again, the, the styling of the automobile and the old newspaper, Dodges and Giants. And they're, they're in New York and, uh, and one more. <laughs> I love that sequence, and uh, it just shows the effect Elvis had on people. And here we are again. That, that hound dog sure is mellow. He must be from the South. So he's left the theater, uh, Studio 50, I believe, which is where David Letterman ended up having his show, by the way, CBS, a legendary theater there. And you just can see everybody, young and old, male, female, black, white. They love this guy. He, he, there's something about him that just pulled it all together. And I've pointed out I love the autograph books. Uh, some of us remember back in the day when everybody would have an autograph book, you know. And so Al documents these great early national TV appearances on Elvis's visit up to New York. And uh, here he happened to be in the recording studio. When Elvis records, Don't Be Cruel, the first recording for RCA, Don't Be Cruel, 
uh, a Hound Dog, and Any Way You Want Me. Three, three incredible songs. And, and when Don't Be Cruel and Hound Dog were released, two songs on the flip side of the same 45, to this day it's the only record that both sides ever went to number one. Not just for Elvis, for anyone. And so, uh, uh, and, and you know, Elvis arranged all his music. He chose what he'd sing. The Colonel had a lot to do with his business. But only Elvis decided how the music was going to be, what the track would be, what the cut would be. And here he is arranging. There's the Jordanaires. There's his, they're, they're the great three, you know, DJ and Scotty and everybody. And I love this picture. Elvis in the background, the Jordanaires in the foreground, that microphone. Look at the, look at the, the woofers and the, the speakers and just, just, the, just the environment, the architectural environment, if you will. And the, you know, Elvis came along in 56 at the same time media was exposing, exploding. We all talk about media and the power of media. TV had just begun, more or less. I mean, we didn't have color TV, I don't think, in 56. And uh, radio was reaching out and expanding. Record sales was expanding. His appearances, so he came when media was exploding. And so again, another important synchronicity there where Elvis coming along at a time where what we all call media now uh, was happening. And he was a great storyteller. He's, uh, he was telling a joke here, Alfred said, and they all loved it. And sometimes he'd tell the same joke, kind of like my friend Gordon, a couple of times. And, 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 and they, they kept laughing at it anyway. And uh, here's one of Gordon's jokes. Did you hear about the girl who got kidnapped? She woke up. Oh, who was kidnapping? Kidnapping. Sorry, Gordon. <laughs> Sorry, Gordon. <laughs> Here, listening to a playback, you know, obviously really into the groove and really into it. And uh, again, look at that shirt, look at that jacket, uh, great style. Al, Al called this the Buddha Elvis because he's sitting, you know, in a lotus position. And again, he, don't be cruel, it was something like 22, 23 takes before he got the one he liked. By the way, my favorite Elvis song, Don't Be Cruel. Um, so here he is, he's done the recording, he's done the show, time to go home, back to Memphis. Penn Station, New York, unbelievable. If anybody's been in Penn Station in the last 10, 20 years, it looks like a, like a car, a parking garage. It's, and, and here is this extraordinary structure. How could it, look at this, it's a great architectural photo of New York. I mean, the light coming in, the way he got those big columns, and, and there's Elvis in the middle of it all. Can you imagine a big pop star like Justin Bieber just hanging out in Penn Station? Wouldn't happen. And it, but this indicates how Elvis was just still on the verge. For me, this photo's about that cop. He looks like a new, typical New York Irish cop. You know, what's going on here? He can't, you know, looks like he'd like to have a word to say about this gathering, but, uh, you know, and look at Elvis carrying his own guitar there, that great Martin guitar. So here he is on the train home, listening to the acetates, RCA. He also gave him a little record player that he could play the acetates on. Long trip home, over 20 hours. Had to take the Great Southern down to Chattanooga and then switch on that train to get over to Memphis. And he listened over, Alfred said over and over for hours, listening to these acetates of these three songs. Again, an indication of how this young musical artist, how, how he's so deeply into his music and to, to, to review it the way he was. This, when Peter Gronlich's book, Last Train in Memphis, went to paperback, this was the cover of that book. Beautiful photo, I love it. And the stylings of the train, you know. Uh, he, here he is stopping in Sheffield, Alabama. This is the first photograph of Alfred's that I ever bought. And uh, just because I liked it. And again, you can, again, this is proof that he wasn't famous yet. There's not a single person looking at him. And including his cousin Junior, he, who wants to get a snack himself. Elvis has some snow cones. And uh, uh, it's just a great photo. And I've always said, there's this Sanskrit word, avatar. It means one who descends. And Elvis looks like he just literally came, beam me down, Scotty. Like he just ended up there. Because look, and the way he's dressed. And I love the characters, Elf, these photos. Look at, you can see the train, but the way these hardworking men and women look, and the, you know, just, the, here's a, you know, it's just a great photo of, in Sheffield, Alabama, people getting on the, off the train for a snack. They continue the trip down to Memphis. There's Junior. Somebody pointed out yesterday that you could see they were cousins, and they're right. This is a great picture of two, two boys from uh, Memphis. And, uh, 
Uh, Elvis is reading uh, Betty and Veronica, Archie Comey. <laughs> He stops in Chattanooga. Again, uh, this lunch counter shot, it looks like a set on a Spielberg film. You can hear those screen doors opening and closing, can't you? And, and that great Coca-Cola logo and that old-fashioned dispenser and, and the, the counter girl with her apron, apron on, I love it, and her, her sleeveless shirt and uh, you know her hair back in the bun and talking to her girlfriend there probably. And here's this woman comes up to the counter to get some food to go. This was a segregated lunch counter. This is Chattanooga in 1956. She could not sit down at that lunch counter, so she would get her food and then leave. And so, again, another example about how these photographs aren't just about Elvis. They're about America, about the times we lived in then. And uh, this is not a posed photo. He was reading Betty and Veronica, and Alfred was sitting opposite, and he simply said, hey, Elvis. And Elvis looked up, and he stole this photo. He just got it. And, and Elvis just, just looked up for a second, looked at him. Elvis took it, and he went back down and read. There, there, in this sequence of photos, there is no sequence. It's unique. You know, I'd see photos of Elvis, and he might be uh, in a swimming pool, and there might be 10 of them. And, and there's one we know. but. There was no sequence. He just got this photo, which has become such a profound and wonderful portrait of this man. And Alloy's like that it was compared to uh, Rembrandt, whose paintings always would have a darker side on one side. And uh, Alfred caught that. Uh, here we're getting towards the end. They were going to Memphis. But Elvis's first home, this is not Graceland, was on Audubon Drive, 1034 Audubon Drive. Great place to visit, by the way. And, uh, he got off and said, listen, can we stop the train? Let me get off here. It was, it was a place called White Station. And, and because otherwise, he had to go into town, get a cab, and then go back to uh, that neighborhood. And I love this shot, by the way, with the trees and the neighborhood. He's walking away. The conductor's watching him go. Here he meets this woman on the, on the corner, and he's asking her directions. You know, he's like, which way to, you know? And uh, you can still see those white bucks. <laughs> He's still got his foot up. <laughs> and and it's, there's a great sequence when you see them in a row. The conductor's hat, there's a certain rhythm to that. Here you see it's White Station. He turns. And, and I've analyzed these photos for dozens of hours just to get the right sequence, where a car is positioned, where that pole is. And you've got cars coming from that way, this way. Look at that old gas station. Remarkable. And there he goes, waves goodbye, right? <laughs> and so uh, heading, heading to his home. Uh, and by the way, this is July 4th, 1956. And my friend Peter Gralnick and I both independently said, uh, and Alfred agreed, that this would be the last walk Elvis Presley ever took as a private person. Because after this day, the colonel's back. He goes on tour. At that point on, there was a circle around him. He signed up with RCA. The song becomes a huge hit. So it's, it's a t touching group of photos, because it really is the last walk you can imagine him taking as a private person. He's home, gets on the motorcycle. He had a motorcycle. His heroes were James Dean and Marlon Brando. And seriously, he loved those guys and wanted to be a, a serious actor one day, and very well could have been. Uh, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a pretty good actor, but the colonel took him in another direction, make a lot of films for a lot of money real quick. And, uh, but the secret of this is that there was no gas in the tank. And, that, and that's why he has that look. It's not like styled and posed and, you know, this was just the way it was. They had a swimming pool. The plumbing wasn't working. That's Elvis's dad, Vernon Presley. And, uh, uh, again, I was even casually with that shirt, he looks cool. They got a garden hose out to fill up the pool. And you can see it's only a few feet high, the water. So he's frolicking with his cousins and his friends, and Al borrows a bathing suit from Gladys Presley and gets in there with his camera. <laughs> Come on, let's hand it to this guy, right? He's, he's shooting him with a girl, he's sh you know, and, 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 but it, if, the water, if the pool had been filled, he wouldn't have been able to do that. And so he grew right in there, and there's a great sequence of those photos of Elvis. There, there's dear Gladys, and who Elvis loved so much, his mother, he loved her to death. And sadly, when she did die, Elvis, you know, was drafted just a few weeks later. And then drafted before that, he had to ship out a few weeks after, after Gladys died. And 
he was very sad. He was very scared, too. He thought his career was going to be over when he went in the Army. He was leaving home for the first time in his life. His mother had died. It wasn't like, hey, you know, happy days and rock, it's a rock and roll, you know, but she's a great woman, loved her son. And that's Barbara Hearn, who was number two in the Miss uh, uh, Tennessee for Miss America, and she was Elvis's high school sweetheart. And she came over to see him, you know, everybody had seen him on TV now, and the buzz was getting bigger, and he's playing the acetates for her. And look at this, he's got his shirt off after the swimming pool. This great thing about Al flying the wall, no publicists, no posing. This was the real Elvis. This is the Elvis who changed the world, really, musically speaking. And he arrives with an escort, uh, the local cops, Navy guy, and uh, he looks like, you know, he's starting to look on top of the world, isn't he? And there's a benefit concert, the Memphis Press Skimitar, Skimitar I, I hope, I'm not saying that right, but the local newspaper was having a fundraiser for the, for the milk for the kids who were in school, a milk, milk, milk project fundraiser. And look at, you can start seeing the fever in that crowd. Here their hometown boy has come home, he's been on TV, the songs are coming out, he made it. The kid made it. And you can see the pleasure on his face. Look at the excitement on Scotty's face. And, uh, uh, and look at the crowd. And as, 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 as one of the docents I met today pointed out, and it's true, 80% of the people who would go to these shows were women. It, and it wasn't men. It was women who really you know, got into Elvis and made him, you know, gave him the adoration we all know he got. And you can see. You just take a quick look, it's all women. And it was great, he, he just had a connection with women. He had a tenderness to him, he had a softness to him. Some people say Elvis had a little androgyny, androgynous look to him, you know, he, he, was, he was a beautiful man, and, uh, but whatever it was, the women responded to Elvis. Here you go, take a look. I mean, look at the looks on these girls. Look at that girl. Is she having fun? I think she's having some fun. This girl, a little too young for her fun. And, uh, you know, look at this girl, sort of a fetching, you know. It's just remarkable, this girl. It's like nobody had ever seen anything like it. I love this girl with her, her finger in her mouth and just looking at him like, what is, he, what is this boy doing? And uh, love the King Edward sign, all of it. But this is Rustwood Park in Memphis, a baseball park. And Elvis just, you know, he said in this concert, he said, because of Steve Allen trying to keep him down, he said, and everybody saw that on TV. He said, tonight I'm going to show you the real Elvis. And, and he did. He really, he really ripped it up. And, and here's the last picture. And I asked Alfred, what's your favorite photo? Did I tell the story already tonight? I said, what's your favorite photo? Which is impossible to do, right? I, but he said, you know, Chris, I really love this photo. His lens was open the same time somebody in the audience had taken a flash. And he, created, he calls it starburst. And, and he saw this light. He saw this persona of Elvis is emerging, you know what I mean? And, and this glow, this, 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 this otherworldly halo, if you will. And it was, this was his star rising, you know? And, uh, and the crowd was going crazy. And Elvis was up there giving them the show of their lifetime. And so Al Al Alfred said to me that this photo sort of personified for him the whole journey he was on with Elvis. And at the end of this show, Elvis went home. Al got a taxi to the train, got a train back to New York. Didn't see Elvis again, ever again. Didn't photograph him ever again until he came to Brooklyn to leave in 1958, and Alfred went to sh sh photograph him as he was disembarking off to Germany. And then there were hundreds of photographers. There were dozens of TV crews. There were dozens of radio stations. Can you imagine, Al was with him all alone all that time. And all of a sudden, this emerges, and he saw what happened. He took some great photos then. They're in the Taschen book, by the way, in the back of it. We included them. And so, Here's Alfred, just a few years ago, I showed you when he was 26 years old, I thought you'd enjoy seeing a photo of Alfred as, as I last knew him, and he was a wonderful gentleman, and uh, 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 he came over from Germany in 1938, he had to flee Germany with his father, from, he had a small butcher shop in Coburg, Germany, and there was a guy named Adolf Hitler, and 
he had to get the hell out of town. And, uh, but I love this picture, holding his most favorite photo. And, and so I love Alfred. And thank you for coming, honoring Alfred, his great photos, honoring Elvis, this great man from the South who, who transformed our culture, and uh, honoring the Telfair for hosting this great exhibit. And thank you for being here.